Hello, welcome to Revenant Reads. I'm Ben, and this is another edition of Fresh Red Kills. So, Fresh Red Kills is where I talk about the books that I have recently finished reading, and I've got two of them here today. I've got a book of poetry, and also uh, one that I picked up at a used book sale. I guess like, neither of them I'm super excited about. Um, so uh, let's start with, with this one. Okay, so this is Contemporary Costa Rican Poetry, a bilingual anthology. So I had picked this up uh, because of a booktube event that is coming up quick, coming up next week. Um, and it is uh, organized by uh, Mark over at Book Time with Elvis. And I know he has some co-hosts along this time. This is the fourth time he's doing it, but it's a really cool idea for an event. Essentially, we are looking at um, a major international soccer tournament. The first time we did it was the Euros, then it was uh, the Africa Cup, and then the World Cup, and next week starts the Women's World Cup. And what happens is, if you want to participate, you are randomly drawn one of the countries that is inside that tournament, and you read something from or about that country. And if that country is defeated by another country, you read something from or about that other country. Uh, and until basically the tournament is over. And I was drawn Costa Rica. So I was trying to look for things to read and I wasn't finding a lot of things that um, uh, either interested me or that I really had time for. <laughs> but this one I found fairly cheap online. I think it was like $5 on Amazon. And I thought a bilingual anthology, that's kind of cool. I mean, I know some Spanish, so I can try and read the Spanish as well uh, and then compare it to the English. And essentially these are all poems, um, obviously Costa Rican authors. All of them have been published since 1990. So these are much more recent than a lot of other collections that you find from countries. Uh, and this was organized by the uh, National University of Costa Rica and the Indiana University of Pennsylvania, a name which confused me, but luckily some uh, kind people in the comments helped me try and figure out what that university, where it actually is. <laughs> um, and I do like poetry. I will admit, though, that I am not always the biggest fan of free verse. Um, I think if, you gotta, if you're going to do free verse well, you've got to be really great with your imagery or your language choice, whatever it might be. I just am partial to things that have meter and rhyme. So this is free verse. And it's also translated free verse. Um, I can't say that a lot of the poems really wowed me or did much for me. A lot of them are very... Uh, ordinary uh, stuff that I've read before, uh, observational stuff. Um, I don't know, you know, little vignettes of people's personal lives, but nothing that really blew me away. Uh, there was one that I ended up liking quite a bit um, that I figured I'd read this one. Um, this is from Julieta Dobles. Hopefully, I'm saying that name right. Um, and this is the house in my dream. So this is one of the ones that I actually liked, one of the few ones that I really stood out to me. Uh, she writes, Covered with old windows and ivy, two stories of silence and music at the outer edge of my childhood meadows. The home of my slow recurrent dreams clings to the edge of the fog in a void where I sense echoes and voices, whirlwinds and abysses, treacherous rocks in the back of fear. They lie out there in waiting like the dark sea of heroes of antiquity long forgotten. Behind us, we close with a thud its great oaken door, as solid as a forest. Its walls adjust to our decisions, successive embraces that love us behind the windows and the desire. Landscapes look over each other, lit by the strange afternoon glow through the solid century-old window panes. Suddenly surprised rose bushes blossom for us, and those brilliant bougainvillea, I'm not sure if I'm actually saying that, <laughs> I can't say plant flower names, um, from the past, and geraniums climbing, awakening the determined climbers that climbed into my life, auspicious, resounding, while the world slept. They happily invade our roof, filling the tiles and walls with shades of purple and aromas, until their own weight detaches them and they fall, covering my pillows with childish laughter. It's just a house, or maybe all houses, on the edge of a dream. So, I like the evocative imagery there, playing around. Uh, that one really worked for me. A lot of the other ones, I just didn't quite get. Um, and as far as the translations go, sometimes I was kind of confused. Um, <laughs> there was one that really confused me as far as translation choice. And that one, 
Uh, the Spanish title is Abrete Sexo, which I translate as Open Up Sex. Uh, but it's been translated into English as Open Up Little Girl, uh, which when I read this, um, there are things like, uh, uh, do not hamper the traveler along his way, little matter of his farewell, if his farewell wounds like a north wind, like a bolt of ice planting splinters in your pelvis. Open up, little girl. I'm like, so I don't understand the choice there of creating it, of changing it to little girl rather than open up sex, uh, because open up sex can sound consensual in a way that open up little girl never could. Uh, so it actually kind of created a more creepiness <laughs> about the poem than I didn't get from the Spanish version. So, um, I don't know, I, and also I should also mention that there is some, in between the authors, uh, there's almost half, a, there's almost a dozen uh, poets that are featured in this. Uh, we have some, some pretty decent artwork uh, from a guy named Carlos Kidd, um, and somebody I can't really show on here, but uh, it's, this was only really okay. Um, uh, I wasn't, I wasn't blown away by it, um, certainly. But uh, there were a few gems in here that I didn't mind. Um, however, I did end up liking it more than the other book I'm going to talk about. Uh, so, <clears throat> this is Hans Majars, uh, The Military Culture of Majars and its Related People. And uh, I, I showed this in a recent um, used book haul that I had gotten from a library book sale. And I'd gotten this because I got a friend who is, I mean, he's Hungarian. He grew up in Hungary up until he's around 12. Um, he lives in Texas now, but we've been best friends for a long time. And I picked this up for him, basically. I figured I'd send this to him. We both also are, like, historical edged weapons enthusiasts. And we both also have shot and practiced with the uh, Hungarian horse bow. Um, so I thought this was perfect. And it had really cool illustrations in here. So I opened it up in the... Uh, you know, at the book sale, and it was cool, like, historical illustrations that had, um, that had captions explaining. I thought, oh, that's perfect. So I brought it home, and I thought, you know, before I send it to him, I should give it a quick read. It wouldn't take very long, and I'm glad that I did start reading it, because, oh boy, um, from the first page of the forward, there were major red flags popping up, uh, and I'll just kind of go into some of these things. Um, there is a claim on the first page that uh, the, basically the earliest evidence um, for a wheeled vehicle comes from uh, an artifact that was found in the Carpathian Basin, where, where Hungary is. Um, and this author extrapolates some wild claims based on that. Uh, first of all, I did a quick fact check on that when I saw that and found that that is not the earliest one. Um, there was one found in Poland that was um, not from the 2000s BC like this one, but it's from the 3000s BC and not in the Carpathian Basin as far as I know. Uh, however, that find was in the 1970s. The book that they cite for evidence for their thing was published in the 1970s. So it predates that. Um, one of the problems with this is we have a lot of claims and not a lot of sources uh, that are cited. Um, and the sources that are cited, you have reason to be very suspicious uh, of where we're getting some of this information from. So based on that image of a wheeled vehicle, I guess, uh, we have things like this being written. Um, this would indicate that the people who migrated from the Carpathian Basin not only traveled by wagon, but also brought with them their burial customs to Mesopotamia. During this migration, they settled and established lasting states, and they took with them their skills in agriculture, their religious beliefs, their military traditions, and their runic script, which goes back 40,000 years and was the base of all modern writing systems. So it was not the Fertile Crescent, it was the Carpathian Basin in which civilization was created. And the people from the Carpathian Basin, if I'm reading that right, went to the Near East and spread it there. And that's pretty much where they start going with this. Um, they claim that Hungarians are related to the ancient Sumerians and also the Parthians, uh, and of course Scythians and Huns. Huns is one that you hear all the time. And, it's one that was accepted for a long time. I think a lot of medieval um, scriptures, uh, medieval texts, Hungarian texts, uh, and even non-Hungarian, I think, link the the Magyars to the Huns. Although I think a lot of modern scholarship doesn't doesn't actually think that that's true, that they are exactly related to the Huns. 
Um, I think that, so this and other things that I was reading started leading me down an internet rabbit hole of uh, Hungarian Turinism, uh, which is a basically a trend that began in the 19th century in Hungary, especially when they were controlled by the Habsburgs. Um, and it was bred probably from some very anti-Germanic sentiment. The Hungarians are linguistically isolated. Uh, their language is not romantic. It is not Germanic. Um, and it seems like people in 19th century were desperate to find kinship with other people, and especially with by looking east to other people who had things like... Um, you know, tradition of horse, horse archers uh, and, and stuff like that. So they try to link themselves to proud warrior cultures of the East. Uh, and sometimes it can go crazy. I mean, it can go as far as people claiming the Japanese are related. And, you know, uh, it, it can get really, really wild. This is something that was flourishing very much in the 19th century. Uh, some of their greatest poets wrote about this sort of thing. It sort of died away in the early 20th century, especially by the time World War II was over. Um, and then in the communist era, uh, that sort of thinking, the Hungarian Turinism, uh, that eastward looking, uh, was seen as basically associated with the the fascists um, of the war period, although that's maybe not entirely justified. It was definitely associated with the right wing um, and conservatives, but it probably didn't feed into the fascism exactly. But then after the fall of communism, it's come back. When I was in Hungary, uh, I didn't realize, you know, I, I did actually see some of this, but I didn't re recognize it exactly for what it was. Uh, when we were in Hungary back in, was it 2009 maybe or something around there? Uh, we went to the Kurultai Festival, which is uh, a several day long, large festival. I think it's in Bogac, maybe. Uh, I don't remember exactly where it was in, uh, in Hungary. But multiple days, people are camping out and you've got people dressed up in, you know, traditional wear. I'm talking like, you know, medieval and even before that. And there's displays of horsemanship. There are craftsmen uh, making things around the place. And honestly, we had a great time. Uh, and some of it certainly goes back to the Maljars, but you'll, certain, you'll also see things, people, you know, claiming earlier kinship with things that are not really, um, you know, evidence-based. And with there's some negative things that also come with Turinism. Uh, I guess anti-Semitism is often related to that. And I started getting indications of that in <laughs> as I was reading this. Um, so there were those kind of weird red flags that were going off. Um, at one point, they're talking about the Parthians and claiming that the Parthians were basically ancestors of the, the Magyar. Uh, and there's this weird non sequitur uh, paragraph that happens in here. Um, it talks about... Uh, let me see. Perhaps it was the religious worldview that intended us to forget this powerful empire where the people lived with religious tolerance as opposed to the neighboring Semitic people who lived with the laws of the revengeful God. The Parthians worshiped the all-loving God who loves all of mankind without exception. Of course, yeah, very. this is a very idealized, mythologized past that we're talking about here. Uh, perhaps this religious worldview intends us to forget that the three wise men from the East who came to visit Jesus came from the Parthian Empire, and that they had been waiting for him, the light of the world, for 3,000 years. He was to bring peace to replace the eye-for-eye -eye revenge of the Semites. The wise men must have come from Parthia because they're the only large territory east of the Roman Empire. I'm, like, I'm wondering, why, why is this, does this exist? I mean, first of all, I'm basically show, throwing shade at Sam Semitism, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> for seemingly no reason. I don't know why they're doing this. But then I realized why they do this. Uh, when looking at their sources and researching it, um, one of their sources is uh, from a guy, and it's not, this isn't the source that they use, but one of the sources is um, a guy who also wrote a book claiming that Jesus was not a Jew, but a Parthian prince. So we have this stuff feeding into it, uh, that Jesus was actually a Parthian prince. And if that's not weird enough, inside this book, they give us Jesus as a Parthian prince. Uh, and they have a little text in here saying, oh, we don't have, like, data to really back this up, and we're not going to comment on whether or not we think it's true or not. I mean, why put it in here, you know, unless you ascribe to the fact that Jesus was actually a Parthian prince and not Jewish? Um, so, you know, not only did the people of the Carpathian Basin apparently give us literature, you know, or at least a writing system and the wheel, uh, they also gave us Jesus, um, apparently. We have other weird passages in here. 
Uh, some years ago, a Hungarian researcher proved by the process of experimentation that the sounds of the Hun Magyar runic script generate energy lines, which produce 95% of the alphabet of the runic script. So our ancestors did not discover the alphabet, but with the help of their holy priests, they recognized the sounds and the connection to the energy produced by them. It's just weird stuff coming <laughs> out of this. So it's a lot of pseudo history, And what the whole thing is, as I'm reading it, I'm... I'm conscious of the fact that I am basically reading a defense of something, right? So essentially, this is a rejection of the Western European version of Hungarian history. Uh, they basically reject the finno ugraic um, theory as far as their language. Uh, it seems like they're insulted in here to be connected to farmers in the north <laughs> that are primitive. Um, that's kind of how they, they put it in uh, one way or another in here. Uh, they want to be connected to warrior cultures. Um, so it seems like it's they're, they're, they they see that stuff as um, basically government uh, propaganda. Uh, and, you know, it all comes from the Habsburgs. Um, so we're, we're, I'm essentially, as I'm reading this, I'm realizing I'm reading a defense of something, right? But I, it's like hearing a defense in court, but not hearing the prosecution. Like, I don't know exactly what they're trying to respond to sometimes. Uh, the writing is kind of jumbled at times, uh, and kind of odd, but, um, whatever their defense is, it is not backed up by evidence. Uh, so only the forward actually cites its sources and the sources, they're all pretty much old. Um, this was published in 2006. We have one thing from 2002, but most of them are from the 70s and beforehand. And some of that's even misleading, because I'm looking at one of them here, and uh, one of the books they cite is from 1974, but that author died in 1945. So this was a reprint or something. Who knows how old that book actually is? It probably predates the, you know, World War II. Um, so it's cherry-picking things from various sources in order to kind of create this mytho-historical narrative um, that's based more on, seems like, wishful thinking than on actual historical evidence. Uh, you know, like I said, it's, it's a shame because the, the artwork is actually really cool. But as I'm looking through this, I can't trust anything that's in here. Uh, and there are some weird claims even inside the, uh, inside the captions. Um, I just can't trust the historical narrative in here at all. And like I said, the forward is the only place where they even cite any sources. And there's other claims in here where they'll mention a researcher or they'll mention a name, but they don't give us a way to f back it up or to, you know, to, to look into that stuff ourselves at all. Um, so this was a big old disappointment, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, and I texted my friend about this and I said, listen, I picked this up for you, but it's, it's bonkers. Um, do you still want it? And he said, yeah, just send it my way. You know, I think they'll get a kick out of it. Uh, but I, I sent him some, you know, basically some pictures of some of the passages in here. And even he was just like, whoa, uh, this is going to be crazy. Um, so anyway, that's my, those are my thoughts on this. Uh, I have a feeling I'm going to get some some angry Hungarian turnism, uh, you know, people basically in my comments uh, trying to set me right. But uh, just just based on the tone of this and how defensive it is. But um, those are my thoughts and all the research that I've done uh, so far. Um, and I have read other things about Hungary. This is not my first, um, you know, exposure to Hungary. Uh, but, you know, I, I love the country, love the people. But this is this is not a. Uh, not going to convince me. Um, so I, I wish I, I wish I had better things to say. This <laughs> this fresh red kills. Uh, so I've got contemporary Costa Rican poetry, which was eh, and uh, Huns and Majars, which I cannot recommend at all, even though the pictures are pretty awesome. Um, and that's it for this week. As always, thank you, Booktube.